Yo, how is it going, Bears fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Bear Down Podcast, where we talk everything Bears every day of the week. I am your host, Chris Malpe, and I am joined with my co-hosts, Jalen McClinton and Parsh Shaw. How's it going, guys? It's going good. How are you? Going great, going great. I'm doing good, and I am doing good for one reason, and that is because we are joined by a very special guest today. We've got the writer for 24-7 Sports' Bear Report, also a contributor for the Windy City Gridiron and the Blitz Network on. He has over 24,000 followers and 161 Bears-related tweets. 161,000. Welcome to the show, Aaron Lemming. Man, you guys did your research on that, especially with the tweet stuff. Man, that's, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. That's the first time for that. Really Aaron, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. So today with Aaron, we're going to be basically breaking down everything that's going on with the Bears right now. Talking a little bit of offseason. We're, we're in a pretty good spot right now between the offseason with free agency and the draft. So let's just hop right into it. I've got the first question here. So Aaron, um, one thing I love about your Twitter is how vocal you are in, in, in how you kind of are a down-to-earth guy and, and call things as you see them. I think you and I have pretty similar views on, on the quarterback position coming into last season. You know, I think you and I both thought that Mitch was going to take that jump and clearly he didn't do that. So what do you think went wrong with Mitch in 2019? And would you put the blame more on him or the offensive line? Well, I think when, when you look at the offensive struggles, I mean, it was a, it was a multitude of different things. Right? Um, but first and foremost, when you draft a quarterback at number two overall and he's going into his third year, you expect big jumps. And I, I know that not the development as a whole is not linear. I, I understand that. But when you look at what Patrick Mahomes has done, when you look at what Deshaun Watson has done, and then when you look at what Trubisky's done, I mean, it's very clear the Bears made the wrong decision. And, I mean, like you pointed out, I mean, yeah, I was absolutely high on Trubisky going into year three. I think that, that unfortunately, because of my view on Trubisky, I was, he was my number one quarterback coming out of the draft. I have no no – you know, no reason to admit less than that. I mean, he was absolutely my number number one quarterback. I was thrilled that the Bears actually drafted somebody that I wanted them to draft in the first round. It usually doesn't happen. With that being uh-huh. said, uh, I think that that definitely clouded my judgment a little bit in my evaluation of his first two years, especially year two going into year three. And really what it came down to was I think part of it was he cracked under pressure. I think – the expectation of him being the number two overall pick, him trying to live up to those expectations. The Bears made the playoffs, maybe arrived a year too early. And to go 12 and 4, NFC North, division winners, you know, so on and so forth, losing the first round of the playoffs. And, you know, you're expecting them to take that next step, and they didn't. And I think that. When you go back and you look, obviously there are some play calling issues. Uh, offensive line was an issue, although not as much as some people would think, at least in the uh, pass protection department. I mean, in terms of when you look at the amount of time that he had um, when he dropped back the pass in 2018 versus 2017, the numbers really weren't that much different. Um, so I, it's, it's one of those things, me, I'm done making excuses. Again, I know... Matt Nagy's play calling was questionable at best. Um, I also think that obviously drops were an issue. The offensive line was an issue at some points. And I also think that the overall running scheme that Mark Helfrich and uh, Harry Heastan brought with them when they came to the Bears clearly did not work with what Matt Nagy was trying to do, which kind of hints at some of the hires that he's made with familiarity. But I do think that Trubisky was absolutely the number one guy to blame. And I think that if you look at it from a quarterback perspective and throwing in even an average quarterback, I think that you all of a sudden you go from an 8-8 eight and eight team to probably a 10-6 and six or 11-5 and five team. I mean, I think the quarterback play for the Bears in 2019 made all the difference in the world. When the trade for Nick Foles happened, one of the first thing you said was that Foles behind his offensive line gives you flashes of Mike Glennon. Do you still have those same feelings, and do you think the offensive line needs to be the primary focus of the NFL draft? So I, I look at it, and I think some of my initial reaction may have been a little bit of an overreaction. I do think that when you look at some of what – when you go back, and this is my nice thing with some of the websites that I write for, right, and especially when you see the iron is – our lead over there, Lester Wolfong, I mean, he goes through, he breaks down, and one of his things that he does in in the season is he goes and he does a single sack watch, and he goes back and he looks at every single sack that the Bears had that season from an offensive standpoint, and he essentially assigns blame, and he looks at it and he goes through and he says, okay, who, who was this on? You know, people love to blame Charles Leno for almost every single sack that happens. I don't know why that is. Huh. 
But you can actually go back, you can look at the breakdown of every single sack and who it was on. And it was actually surprising the amount of times that it was actually on Trubisky for simply not making his reads, right? So I do think, obviously, offensive line uh, play does need to improve. I'm a little surprised, um, admittedly so, that they haven't done a little bit more to address their offensive line, especially the interior with right guard. Um, so I, I think it really comes down to scheme dependency, right? And you're looking at a guy I see who they brought in as their offensive line coach. You're looking at him to hopefully kind of go back to the more familiarity of what they've had within the Andy Rico coaching tree. I mean, uh, you really look at it, you look at some of Matt Nagy's hires, especially offensively, and he brought in a guy in Mark Helfrich as our offensive coordinator who he had no experience with. Same thing with Harry Heastand. And all of a sudden you see that some of those moves really didn't work. So now you bring in John Filippo as their quarterback coach. You bring in a guy like Bill Lazor who has some experience in Andy Reid on uh, coaching tree as well. You bring him as the offensive coordinator. You bring in Juan Castillo as the offensive line coach who is absolutely an Andy Reid disciple. And you try to get back to the basics, which is what has worked for Andy Reid, which is what has worked for Doug Peterson. So it's kind of a long way to answer, but I think that Nick Foles is not mobile. I mean, there's yeah. just no doubt about that. Right? So you're, I think the ultimate goal moving into 2020, um, beyond what they end up doing more at right guard, if they end up drafting, you know, an offensive tackle in the first, you know, two rounds of the draft and hope they can develop him, whatever it may be. The ultimate goal is obviously to take some of those sacks that were assigned to Trubisky, which I think was, I want to say it was 12 or 15, and you wow. know, kind of move that away and say, okay, Nick Foles is going to be the guy that understands the offense. Nick, Nick Foles is going to be the guy that's going to make the read when he needs to make the read. And hoping that with better offensive line play, with a better overall scheme fit, with a more zone block, fit, I think that's the big key because Harry Stan was more of a hybrid style. Uh, with more of an inside zone blocking scheme, um, hopefully they'll throw some outside in there as well. Um, hopefully they will be able to take away some of the sacks, have obviously more time for Foles, assuming that he's a starting quarterback, which I think he will be, have more time for him back in the pocket. Um, and I think that's really going to help the situation. And I think also, you know, the run game is going to be big as well because you can't be one dimensional. It's like with Trubisky, it, it, obviously he had different issues, but you can't be one dimensional with a statue-esque quarterback back there. The one thing I will say, the big the big difference between a guy like Mike Lennon and the big difference between Nick Foles is their athleticism is very similar. They're very similar in stature as well. But the one thing that Nick Foles has over a guy like Mike Lennon is the fact that he can actually anticipate pressure. And not only can he anticipate pressure, but he seems to be able to step up in the pocket when he needs to and avoid pressure uh -huh. at time. Now, again, you know, you look at what he did with Philadelphia. He played behind a excellent offensive line. The Bears aren't on that level, but I think you're looking more for individual growth at this point and for some of those guys to get back to the 2018 form instead of what they look like in 2019. So long story short, uh, I don't think that he's quite as big of a liability, and that was, I guess, more hyperbole on my part than a guy like Mike Lennon. But I do think that pass protection does need to hold up more than a guy like Trubisky, who was a lot more athletic. Uh -huh. Uh, so what's up, Aaron? So you said the best thing for the that can happen for the Bears is that the light to click on Trubisky and never look back. How how likely do you think that happens? And even though you kind of already answered the question in, in the last question, who do you think will be the week one starter? Well, you know, it's again. I mean, Trubisky is obviously when you when you look at it. I know a few people kind of looked at the fifth year option, and it's like let's just be honest here. The, the fifth year option is more than likely going to get declined. That's just where it's at yeah. right now. I mean, there's there's no reason to guarantee Trubisky. Any more money than you need to at this point. Yes, I understand that it's still, you know, it'd be $24, $25 million for the fifth-year option. It doesn't actually kick in until a 2018 draft class when everything becomes fully guaranteed, but it's still guaranteed under injury. So it's like, I, I guess, let me ask you guys this. Would you guarantee right now, knowing Bisky's health and the fact that he's been hurt the last few years, would you guarantee him $25 million, knowing the way he is right now, would you guarantee him $25 million for the 2021 season? I'm going to say no. Uh, I know there's one person here that's going to say yes, but I'm going to say no personally. Parth, how about you? By the way, Parth, uh, Parth runs an Instagram page called Trubisky Nation with 20,000 followers, so he might be biased. But uh, I, I'd, still not, I'd still decline the option. $25 million for Trubisky is way too much money. He has not shown us anything to give us... Give him more than anything, like more than $10 million, in my opinion. Even that. 
yeah. even that. Jalen, what do you so think? So I'm gonna be the lone wolf. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say yes. Um, obviously, we we me and Chris, we we um our diff, our opinions are completely different. He thinks Foles is gonna start Week One. I, I honestly think it's gonna be Trubisky. You know, you know, he's coming into this his fourth year. You know, he obviously had a lot of pressure on him. He has a quarterback who can you know come in and take over his spot or help him. So I I definitely think that's gonna you know wake him up hopefully. But I would I would I would pick it up because if he do come into his fourth season as a starter, you know, play at least close to what he did in 2018, then we're not going to let him just, you know, hit the open market because he's obviously probably not going to return because another team is going to probably pay him more money, especially if they're going back needy. There's really no wrong answer here, right? I mean, it's, it's, we, we can't, none of us can tell the future. Me personally, I'm not guaranteeing him anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, the other, the other kind of thing to take in mind here, and this is kind of what I've been trying to, you know, get through, to some people who have maybe have that same mindset or don't want to even risk him being a free agent after the fourth year, assuming that the light was click on, is they can franchise tag him. And that's kind of the thing. The franchise tag is going to run a little bit more expensive. You're probably looking 31, 32 million. So, I mean, you're looking at the difference of six or seven million dollars a year. But when you're talking about a franchise quarterback, I mean, the reality is simple. If, if the guy's, if, if he is the guy, then he's the guy. And if he's not, he's not. And I think that's kind of the risk that. Right now, you look at it, and it's like, okay, the Bears only really guaranteed $21 million to Nick Foles because of the restructure, right? So $21 million yeah. over three years, I mean, that's that's basically, I mean, just to give you an idea, Nick Foles is set to make a base salary or basically a base cap hit, I should say, of $5.33 yeah. million this year. Chase Daniel made more than that last year as a whole. So the money doesn't lead to say that, that Nick Foles is the unquestioned starter, but I do think the overall scheme fit and everything else. To answer your question, really, no, I don't think that the light is going to come on for Trubisky. I really don't. I think I think a lot of it's mental. I mean, he has the physical tools. He doesn't have an Aaron Rodgers-like arm. I'm not going to say that, but I do think that he has more than suitable arm. He's got a good arm. He's got great athleticism. He's got pretty much every single tool that you really want, but a lot of it's mental. Whether it comes yeah. down to cracking under the pressure of living up to being a pick, uh, whether it comes down to cracking under the pressure of being in an open competition, uh, whatever it may be, or just simply simple mechanic stuff like footwork. I mean, that was just, he showed, and that's the thing that's kind of confused me with Trubisky, is he's shown a lot of the inconsistencies that I didn't see in his one year at uh, uh, North Carolina. I just didn't see it. I mean, I, I love Trubisky coming out. It wasn't so much because he had such a high ceiling, but I thought a lot of what he did was actually repeatable. And I thought that that translated into, I, I mean, my pro comp for him was a more athletic Matt Ryan. I thought that yeah. they were very smart quarterbacks except for that. And so, no, I don't think that he's, I don't think the light's going to come on. Uh, I'll be honest. I'll actually say the exact opposite. I think that he's going to crack even more into the pressure than he did last Last year, and I think that the familiarity with Nick Foles um, being in the system, with his familiarity with Matt Nagy, with uh, John D. Filippo, um, and with this offense as a whole. I mean, obviously, some of the language is going to be slightly different, but for the most part, I think that his familiarity, and the fact that the light does come on for him in big moments. I mean, if he won a Super Bowl with the Eagles when everybody pretty much counted them out after Carson Wentz went down with a torn ACL against the Rams. I think he's absolutely going to rise to the occasion. Uh, it does benefit the Bears in every way, shape, or form for them to, even if they do decline the fifth-year option, for Trubisky to figure it out because you franchise tag him, you get a new deal done. It's the same thing that happened with Kyle Fuller. Everybody thinks that just yeah. because you don't use a fifth-year option on a player, that bridge is burned. That's not the case. It has nothing to do with that. I think that even for as competitive as Trubisky is, I think he can also see that going into year four, he has not lived up to expectations. And I mean, if the Bears are to decline that, which I do think they will, if they decline that fifth year option, I think it's 100% justified. I don't think it's going to be something that Trubisky would take personally if the light does come on and if he plays up to being tagged or a new contract. I just, I don't think that's even a remote concern at this point. I hope the light comes on, but I don't think he's, it's going to. Absolutely. I mean, when you think about it, me being an athlete, and I know Parson athlete too, you wouldn't think that that professional athletes are having mental breakdowns or, or mental issues like that. But but at some point, I feel like pressure is something in sports that can creep up on everyone, and I feel like it, it's it's definitely done that for Mitch. All right. So now we're gonna we're gonna shift away from the quarterback situation here. We got a couple of free agency questions for you. So how important do you think it was replacing Leonard Floyd this off season? In following the addition of Robert Quinn, do you think this defense can return to their 2018 form? I I think it was huge. I, I think, you know, when you, when you look at the defense as a whole, obviously they retain Danny Trevathan as well. 
but they have two holes in the secondary right now. And I know that some people are a little higher on the competition, especially at corner. You got Kevin Tolliver, yeah. uh, you got Roberson back there. And you also have Artie Burns on a one year deal. Um, and then even that safety, I mean, you got Deion Bush and Jordan Lucas and DeAndre Houston Carson. I think that needs some more there. Either way, when you look at it, uh, last year the Bears really lacked in the pass rushing department. Uh, part of that was because Leonard Floyd was simply – he just didn't live up to expectations in terms of being a pass rusher. Part of that was because Akeem Hicks went out. But another big part of that, in my personal opinion, was when you look at the amount of sacks that any other edge rusher on the team had outside of Cleo Mack or Leonard Floyd, and that was zero because Aaron Lynch was playing the five-tech position much more than he was playing any outside linebacker role – which left Isaiah Irving is basically the one guy that was actually doing anything. He had zero sacks. So I think when you look at the overall construction of the defense, especially when you look at what Chuck Pagano likes to do, he's known for developing secondary. I mean, I, I don't really, I mean, he likes Deion Bush. I don't particularly see it. Okay, whatever, not a big deal. Uh, but when you look at that front seven, I think that it's it's huge, obviously, to have, it's, it's huge to have Hicks back. It's huge, obviously, to have Mac. We don't, we don't really need to go through those guys, but Getting a more pure pass rusher in the form of somebody like Quinn is huge. It's yeah. it, it's one of those because all of a sudden, and that's the thing that blew my mind so much last year, is especially when Akeem Hicks went down, you know, and even before that, it's like Mac was seeing double and triple teams on a consistent basis, and Leonard Floyd still wasn't getting home on much of his one on ones with any offensive tackle, and that's that's kind of the bigger issue. And you look at a guy like uh, Robert Quinn who. Had more sacks last year, at least the last time I checked, and I could be I could be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. He had more sacks than uh, than Demarcus Lawrence did. And if you have the type of edge rusher on the other side that you have in Quinn, it's going to cause havoc. And that's the thing. I mean, it's it's a lot harder to make a good secondary look better with a you know so-so uh, front seven than it is to have a great front seven and have a more questionable secondary in a few spots and make that that secondary look better so i think it was absolutely a big move i know a lot of people are going to look at it and they're going to say okay well they've already had big money invested in uh obviously khalil mack they've got big money invested in the king hicks as well but Again, it's, it's one of those positions where you can never have enough pass rushers, and I do think that they need to address. I, I would not feel comfortable going into the season with their current depth at outside linebacker. Mingo is not a pass rusher, and neither is Isaiah Irving. Uh, but you at least have those two front-line guys to where it's a hell of a lot better than it was last year getting the passer. And I think you also have enough between Mac and, I mean, Quinn's really not a bad run defender by any means, but even on the interior with Goldman, um, obviously with Hicks, and then even with a guy like Roy Robertson Harris, you have enough run defense to where I don't think you're really overly concerned about losing the value that you have with Leonard Floyd against the run and even really against the pass. I mean, it's just the way Chuck Pagano runs his defense is very much set up for having the pure pass rusher like a Robert Quinn on the other side. Because, I mean, really, Clo Maxim. A really good athlete for one. He's just a really good edge defender as a whole. I mean, he's somebody who can do it all. So it's like if you need to put more on him, that's why you're paying him an average of twenty three million dollars a year. So I think that was that was huge for this defense. I do think that you need to address the secondary in some way, shape, or form, whether that's in the draft or with a veteran mm -hmm. signing uh, or on the cheaper end. But I do think that there's a lot better of a chance of the Bears defense getting back to form with a better pass rush. I mean, I think that was at least when you look at the numbers, I mean, I think they had, what, 33 sacks last year and 51 the year before. Uh, yeah. I mean, then we kind of saw the dip. It wasn't a huge dip, but it was enough of a dip to where they weren't that same dominating unit that they were in 2018 under Vic Fangio. And I think a lot of that happens to do with the pass rush. I mean, just look at the numbers. Yeah. A lot of people weren't too happy about the Jimmy Graham signing. Based on the money we paid him and the no-trade clause in his contract, that being said, do you think one of the reasons that Graham regressed in Green Bay was because of him or the QB play in Green Bay? Well, I don't... I mean, I'm definitely... As much as I'm obviously not a Packers fan, uh, I it's, it's really hard to knock Aaron Rodgers. I mean, he's just a fantastic quarterback. So I'm not going to knock the quarterback play. I do think that when you go back and you look at some of what happened with the Green Bay offense, I do think that maybe there should be a little bit more blame on Rodgers than there was, um, even with the pass catchers that they had there in Green Bay. I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I wasn't a huge fan of the Jimmy Graham signing. And it's just, 
and from a lot of ways, it just didn't make sense, right? And it's not the player himself. I understand the role. I understand the, the what they're looking for, the familiarity with Ryan Pace and Jim Graham. That's not my issue. My issue is why are you signing a guy on day two of free agency that doesn't he doesn't garner nine million dollars yeah. guarantee? It just you, he just simply doesn't. Now I do think that he's a solid fit for what the Bears are looking to do. I think. They've kind of put themselves in a weird position, though. If you re- if you really look at the roster, right now, they got ten they got ten tight ends on the roster, right? <laughs> yeah. And basically, outside of, I mean, really outside of Demetrius Harris, I mean, they they really don't have any other blocking tight end on their roster. So you pretty much you've got uh, Trey Burton, who it makes more sense to keep than cut at this point. I mean, if you yeah. can trade him, okay, cool. But in terms of cap space. It's like you're really not saving much, and you'd be paying him more for him to go to a team. You got Jimmy Graham. Uh, uh, you got Ben Broniker. Uh, you got, I mean, there's just, uh, when you really go down the line, I mean, those are three guys right there that are making well over better minimum. You know, it's, and you can't keep all those guys on the roster. You know, you got JP Holtz, who actually had a pretty solid, you know, pretty solid year for what it was. Uh, you also had, you know, Jesper. It, there was, there was multiple, multiple yeah, I mean, Jesper Horstad. I mean, there's multiple names on the roster that you could justify having that are cheaper. So, it's kind of one of those situations where, and I know a lot of people have kind of looked at it. And they say, "Well, I think the Bears need to draft a tight end." It's like you got t- ten tight ends on the roster right now, and it, it's like you can kind of mix and match to who's going to make the roster right now and who, what makes the most sense. I don't know that adding another body to tight end right now makes a lot of sense, especially when you have other needs at receiver. Uh, so I, man, I don't know. I, I the the Graham sign makes sense in terms of fit. Uh, this year, I guess, is kind of a, a win now move, but I still don't really understand what they were doing. But I, I mean, when you look at a separation rate and you look at some of the different things that he was able to do, I do think some of it was uh, scheme related for sure. Um, but again, I mean, you're not getting the Jimmy Graham that was in New Orleans, you're not getting the Jimmy Graham that was at his prime in Seattle. So I think as long as people know that going in, you know, you're not getting a blocking tight end in any way, shape, or form. I think, you know, it is what it is. It's just more of the money. I mean, the, the no the, the no trade cost means nothing. Uh-huh. He was never going to get in the first place. There's there's too much money guaranteed to a guy like that, frankly. He's probably not going to be around in 2021 unless he gets back to the Jimmy Graham of, you know, 2012. So, it, I don't know. again, the signing did make a ton of sense for me at the money when you look at it like that. But if you're just looking at the player in terms of fit, it, it still does make some sense. He's still not a bad player. I think he's still got some value. And the biggest thing is, is a lot more reliable health-wise than a guy like Trey Burton. So, uh, so excuse me. So, staying on free agency, what which fir- former first-round pick do you think will have the most success in 2020 out of Burns, Ifedi, and Mingo? I think Ifedi is going to get probably the biggest chance <clears throat> here. Um, I, I, I liked the. Yeah, that's the thing. There's there's real there's no real downside in these moves, right? I mean, the the reality is is you know if, if they don't work out, they don't work out. You you barely spend any money on them. Uh, it is what it is. I think that the competition at corner is going to be interesting because you know with Burns, I think ultimately it's going to come down to Burns and uh, and Kevin Tolliver. But I do think Kevin Tolliver has the overall edge and. I think it benefits them a little bit more to have a guy that they've developed and that is a little bit more cost control. But when you look at, when you look at actual, depending on, obviously this could change after the draft, but when you look at their current right now, I think if has got the biggest chance to start. And I think another thing that is intriguing with him, right, is that he basically, he played right guard his first year in the league yeah. of Seattle, had a, a much better product, not great, but a much better product than what he produced at right tackle. And a lot of it comes down to hands with him. I mean, he's just he's he's overly aggressive. His hand placement's weird. Uh, he had a lot of penalties too, which is another thing that I, just doesn't make a ton of sense to me. So I think moving him inside and playing more to his strengths, because at least to me, coming out of Texas A&M, I thought he projected more of a guard than he did a tackle. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes you can move tackles inside to guard. I mean, Eric Flowers is kind of a prime example of that. There's there's been a few other guys that have done that as well, where Sometimes you just don't project the same way that you do in college. So I think that if Fetty has the highest upside, it is weird because even for as questionable and as inconsistent as he was in Seattle, there were a lot of people that actually had him projected to get anywhere from six to eight million dollars on the open market. His offensive linemen are just so valuable. It's yeah. just, I mean, of course, Fant, who was a backup tackle for Seattle for the longest time and even played some in a weird tight end role, ended up getting three years and $30 million. You got, you know, you got the same amount of money that Brian Bulaga got, which is weird to me. So offensive 
offensive line value as a whole, especially in free agency, is always really weird. You always kind of sometimes you see those guys that maybe should have got paid a little bit more uh, that didn't. But I yeah. think Effetti is one of those guys where this is a Juan Castillo pick. This is the guy that Juan Castillo wanted. They there were so multiple other names out of the free agent market that were a little bit older that they could have got that was more of a plug and play type of uh, you know type of situation versus a guy like Effetti where they see some untapped potential. They see more upside, and ultimately, it's kind of a win-win because if he if he plays well, and even if the Bears can't retain him, then all of a sudden you've got a situation for, for a Fetty where he can hit the market again next year, and he can get big money. And if he develops at a decent rate and he's worth keeping around, then maybe the Bears can you know get him on a, a on a team-friendly deal. But he's definitely the guy out of all the the first-round picks, the, the failed first-round picks really that they signed. I think he's the one with the highest upside, and I think he's also the one that has the largest, uh, you know, amount of, you know, chance basically to, to start the season. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I, I just remember, I, I also agree with you on that one. I remember watching him play tackle against the Bears in 2018 when Mac just went crazy in his second game for the Bears. That was not a fun one, at least for him. But um, uh, before we actually started recording, we talked to you how about everyone here at Bear Down. Is, is college or younger. So we have some aspiring writers on our website, as well as a, a whole group of people behind the scenes, like editors, graphic designers, and most of us are currently in college. So what advice would you give to anybody who wants to go into sports media one day that, that's a that's a young kid? Well, I, I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, and granted, that I guess it should just kind of be thrown off right off the bat. I mean, this is something that I really, writing, podcasting, all that stuff is something that I really enjoy doing. But it's yeah. also, it's just a hobby for me. I, I work full-time as an IT guy. I mean, that's one of the reasons I just moved to Dallas. Like, I, this is not my full-time job. It's, it's a lot of fun, um, but, you know, I, I just kind of want to throw that right out, you know, kind of throw that out there just so everybody's aware. Like, I'm, you know, I'm not a professional by any means. This is what I would say. I had zero experience doing any sort of writing. When I, when I first started, basically what happened was I got a Twitter. The only reason I got a Twitter is because I lived in the middle of nowhere in California, and there was nobody to talk bears with, right? So I got Twitter, started getting on, talking baseball, talking football, saw a writing opportunity, and you know, submitted basically an article to try and write. And ultimately, I got turned down. And it was kind of one of those situations for me where I just decided I really want to write. So I found an outlet. Uh, mine was actually Rant Sports. I don't know if Rant Sports is still around. It was a really good start for me. And one of the biggest things that I learned throughout my time, especially early on writing, was – Take as much critical advice that you can get because here's the thing. Like the only way that you're going to get better at things and the only way that you're going to learn things is if somebody is objective and critical with you. And sometimes, yeah, it's going to suck if somebody tells you, hey, you know, your writing's not very good or this you can do better or whatever it may be. But I think that's big because I think learning exactly – how to be the writer that you want to become for one and actually making your stuff readable and, and fun to read is, is, is big because I mean, let's, let's be honest here. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different people who write. There's a lot of different people who do podcasting and everybody's going to have their niche. Everybody's going to have their own style for how they want to do things. So if you're having fun with it and you know, you're, you're enjoying what you do and you're getting better at it. I mean, I think it's a win-win. The one thing I will say and this is something that has been explained to me multiple times over the years from people in the business is that you want to make sure if you're trying to go into sports journalism that, okay, you can be a good writer. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, but you also want to be well-versed because you want to be able to go on TV. You want to be comfortable in front of a camera. You want to be comfortable behind a microphone. You know, you want to, you want to be able to jump on a phone and do a radio spot yeah. and confidently know what you're talking about because there's a difference between knowing what you're talking about and then getting on the radio, and trust me, I've had this happen multiple times. Joe Ostrowski from 670 The Score actually gave me my first ever uh, radio spot, and I was scared to death. And I go back and I listen to some of those, I'm like, oh my gosh, I was terrible. You know, like it stuttered the entire time, saying the same little things. And I think that's big too, because you, you want to be comfortable in front of a camera. You want to be comfortable behind a microphone, even if you're doing podcasting. And I think a big thing there is to kind of go back and listen to yourself, right? You you go back and you do these radio spots. You know, if you do something on 670 or something like that, they're always going to have podcasts. If you do a podcast, if you have your own podcast, go back and listen to it from time to time. 
and be critical with yourself and, and listen to how you're talking. And sometimes your mind has a tendency to, you want to say one thing and you have nervous tics, you have certain things that you do. And those are the kind of things that you want to eliminate. And I, I think just really, if you're passionate enough about it and it's something that you truly want to do for, for a profession, for a hobby, whatever it may be, there's always different ways to go back and, and really improve at your craft. And I think the big thing, you know, for a lot of people is simply to be able to take criticism and yeah. it can suck. Trust me. I've, dude, I've done, I've done a lot of different things. I, I was in the band for a while. I, you know, we signed to a record label, we did certain things and it's, but along the way, you always get different uh, advice, different critiques from people. And it's very important to be able to take that and to objectively go back and look at your writing, to be able to object objectively go back and listen to your podcast or whatever you're doing and make those improvements. Because trust me, I mean, there's a lot of people who are very one dimensional and there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be vying for the same jobs that you are. And the more experience that you have and the more versatility that you have and the better season that you are going into those jobs, especially if you're trying to make that a career. I mean, that's just the, the better leg up. That yeah. you can that you can probably have. So that would be my advice. And again, this isn't really coming from a professional standpoint. Of more of just what I've learned over the last five six years of writing, doing podcasting, doing radio spots, and just trying to, you know, even though it's a hobby, it's still you you want to be good at it. You want to yeah. be able to improve. You want to be able to have anybody on the face of the planet listen to it and and respect it. So I mean, that would be that would be my advice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so going back to football. How do you think the Bears fare in the NFC North in 2020? You know, I looked at it and I, and I got, man, I got some interesting responses uh, between the side. I think it was like last week. I I think the Bears are right in the mix. I mean, obviously a lot of it comes down to quarterback, right? I don't think they've had the strongest of off seasons, but I mean, let's look at the rest of the NFC North. Mm -hmm. This is all, you know, just there's an asterisk by this because obviously the draft's about to happen. The Bears have the least amount of picks of, out of anybody in the division. But still, when you go back and you look at the offseason so far, Minnesota, I don't know what the hell Minnesota Yeah, I, I no just, kidding. Probably not the only one. And haven't really done much in return. Uh, Green Bay, at least in my personal opinion, they've allowed some talent to walk, like a Brian Bulaga, and they've replaced him with the lesser guy in a Ricky Wagner. Um, you know, the same thing, they let Blake Martinez walk, they replaced him with Christian Kirksey. Kirksey's a good player, but Kirksey never stays healthy. So... And then the Lions, I mean, and this is, <laughs> I mean, Lions. I, let's be honest here, the Lions are so far behind the rest of the division right now, and especially <laughs> with their coach, where it, they're, at least to me, they're not even in the conversation. I mean, it's just really that simple. The, 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 the talent gap is so much different between the Bears, the Packers, and the Vikings than it is with the Lions right now, where I think the Lions have gotten better, but at the same time, again, you're, you're trading out Darius Slay, for Marcus, uh, not Marcus Trufant, uh, well, Trufant, Desmond Trufant, Trufant. Trufant. Yeah. you know, it's, it's one of the, like, that's, it, I'm sorry, I've had multiple Lions fans try to tell me otherwise, uh -oh. but that's not, <laughs> that's not, that's not an equal trade-off there. Uh, they lost Snacks, Harrison, uh, they've lost talent. They've been trading away talent for the last year. It's, they're not a very good team, and again, I think they have one of the worst head coaches in the league, and until that situation gets figured out, until they prove me different, I think it's a three-team race, but I absolutely think the Bears are in the mix, and I think when you objectively look at it with the Packers, I mean, when you look at the overall, the advanced statistics and everything that the Packers did last year, they were one of the luckiest and one of the and worst 13-3 teams, three teams yep. in recent memory. When Again, when you go back and you look at the analytics of the team. Minnesota, I mean, they really weren't that much better than the Bears last year. I think the difference between the Bears and either one of those two teams going into this year, much like last year, is going to be quarterback play. They have yep. to get better quarterback play. If they get 2018 Trubisky, whether that's Foles or whether that's, that's Trubisky, if they get that kind of play out of the quarterback position, then I think they're going to be they're going to be on top of the division again. But again, there's still there's still the draft to go through. You got to see what happens. Uh, but I absolutely think that you can do a one A, one B, one C for the NFC North right now, and then the Lions are just the Lions. Yep. Uh, so. Coming into this season, you know, Aaron is on his last year of his contract. Do you think it's a realistic chance that we don't resign him? What's a realistic chance that we do not resign Aaron? Allen Robinson. Yeah, it was, so with Robinson, I think that something's going to get done. I, I know that there's been some conflicting information going around uh, in terms of 
where they're at with contract negotiations. He's a priority. And again, you go back and you look at it when you're talking franchise tag, the more realistic approach, if they're going to use a franchise tag next year, you know, with how things currently stand, you franchise tag and you, you figure something out. I don't think it's going to remotely get to that point. I think that you look at Danny Trevathan, right? And you look at what they did with Eddie Jacks and stuff like that. And I think that sometimes we forget that Ryan Pace does the majority of his extensions uh, in the latter part of the off season, you know, moving into the last part of uh, the preseason before they get in the regular season. I mean, every year he's done some sort of an extension with a player and I don't think that's going to be any different this year for uh, for the Bears. And I think Allen Robinson is going to be the target. Because here's the thing. You look at the offense, and there's been one consistent weapon that the, the Bears offense has had over the last two seasons that's been Allen Robinson. And I do think, to a certain extent, uh, some of the deals that have been signed, especially the Amari Cooper deal, um, that definitely hurts the Bears a little bit because – you go from maybe $16 million a year, you know, just kind of throwing it out there. I mean, Allen Robinson's still young, so he's probably going to get four or five years on top of the extension. Yeah. Uh, but now you're in probably more in the $18 million, maybe even $19 million range because much like the quarterback market, the wide receiver market is always going to be ever resetting, especially with the way the cap's going up. Now, with that being said, I think the Bears are fully prepared to pay him somewhere around that. I think maybe the guarantee could be part of the issue right now. And quite frankly, I mean, Ryan Pace is attacked free agency. The you know the initial waiver free agency is over with. Now they got to get through the draft. And then after that, they got to reassess the roster again and see if there's any other veteran additions that they can make to the roster before going into training camp, hopefully training camp and, and the preseason and all that. Uh, so I think that Allen Robinson is, is absolutely a top priority. I think something's going to be done, but I think that right now with the just the overall portion of the offseason that they're in, it's not going to be on the front burner. It's going to be more of the back burner, but once everything kind of gets worked out and you start seeing training camp and preseason all that stuff, I think that's when things are going to ramp back up. But I would fully expect them to get some sort of deal done. I think, if anything, if you're looking at an offensive weapon that may not get extended or that's going to be more in question, I think it's going to be Tariq Cohen. He's going on the last year of his rookie deal. And he's not valuable enough to franchise tag. Um, and he's also somebody who, depending on what kind of year he has this year, I mean, he could price himself out of, out of uh, the Bears' breach. So I would be, if you're a Tree Cohen fan, I'd be more concerned about a deal getting done with him than I would be Alan Robinson at this point. Absolutely. So we're running out of time here. All I need from you is two words for this answer. Who's one Bear you think is going to break out in 2020? I think I know who you're going to say, but I just need two oh, words on that one. One Bear that's going to break out. I think... You know, I actually think it's going to be, I think it's Anthony Miller. I, I think Anthony Miller is, I think he's, man, he's, especially that the, the, the last, probably the last half of last year, I mean, he really started showing those flashes. I think consistent quarterback play is going to help a lot, but I, I think it's going to be Anthony Miller. Awesome. And also, I mean, depending on what happens with that line, you, you never know with Montgomery. He's a special guy as well. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Aaron. That was awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate you guys having me on. And, you know, hopefully we can uh, do this at some point when the season gets close or in season. And, you know, best of luck to you guys. And obviously, if you guys ever need anything, just reach out. Absolutely. If you guys would like to find more stuff from Aaron, you can obviously find him on Twitter at Aaron Lemming NFL. You can also find some of his columns on 24 7 Sports' Bear Report and also the Windy City Gridiron and the Blitznet. That is pretty much it for us. You can find all of our social media down in the description. You can find more content from us at BearedDown.com. And you can also follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at BearedDown. As always, Chicago, that's pretty much it for us. Bear down. Peace.